Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the bench. Um, in this part three series of our oscilloscope, <laughs> I'm getting tongue twisted today, take two. In this third part of our oscilloscope series, uh, I want to go over modern, not ultra modern oscilloscopes, but basically the way an oscilloscope works today and um, how to actually use the functions of a scope. Now in our last video, really the only things that we, that I wanted you to come away with was the two major components of an oscilloscope and that was the vertical component and the horizontal component and that the vertical component, you know, the vertical input is what measures volts and the horizontal is time base. And now we talked a little bit about um, the time base being different than than it was in our first scope. So in that in that vacuum tube oscilloscope, it was a very basic bottom of the line uh, first generation kind of scope. And all it really could do, as we could see, was we could look at waveforms, but we really couldn't measure them accurately. And it really wasn't very good. Uh, you know, for much much above audible frequencies, let's say. Uh, once you get up into RF and things like that, unless you were using, um, you know, using a uh, XY mode, which we'll talk about later on, that's a little more advanced thing to deal with, you really couldn't use the internal time base on that to get any, any sort of <laughs> sync on a high frequency signal. So what you're looking at right now is really a very good oscilloscope. Um, it is old. This scope is probably over 20 years old or more. Um, eh, it's probably 30 years old maybe even. I don't know. But it's definitely an old scope. But uh, the old saying, oldie but a goodie, this is definitely one of them. And I have two of these types of oscilloscopes as you've seen in my videos. Uh, the one up above you know, the one sitting on top of the signal generator is a model, it's a, made by a company called Tektronics, and we talked about them, and it's a model 2465, and this is a model 2467. They're very similar oscilloscopes, and they're both, the models that I have are both uh, 400 megahertz models, and, uh, that's pretty high frequency for an oscilloscope. I mean, they have scopes that go up into the gigahertz now, but you can get tens of thousands of dollars in those. Um, even these ones in their day, probably, you know, five to ten thousand dollars for one of these back in the day. But anyway, um, we'll get more into the little details later, but right now let's just talk about how we're going to use an oscilloscope just in the most basic form. So. If we look at a modern oscilloscope, um, you have your screen and you always are going to have some adjustments and on the newer scopes, the, the, you know, the fully digital LCD, the, the knobs can be in different places and sometimes one knob does multiple functions and things like that. That's why we're going to go with this kind of middle generation scope. It kind of puts things into sections if you notice and makes it a little easier to identify them and uh, for me to teach you what they are and what they do. So down here when we turn our scope power on, this scope is new enough that it actually does have some kind of software in it and it does have to boot up and it does go through a self-test and as you can see um, it's kind of checking all of the functions and then when it finishes it comes up okay now this scope here has a, a high intensity uh, uh, CRT screen and it's actually called a, a uh, uh, what do they call these? Bright, bright screen or something like that. Tektronix had a name for it. Bright eye. That's it. Bright eye. And really, the main difference between a bright eye and my other scope above it, the 2465, has a standard CRT. This bright eye scope will get super duper bright. And what you're going to find out is, as you start pushing the limits of an oscilloscope um, to its to its maximum bandwidth. In other words, you're putting 
the highest frequency that it can respond to, you'll see that the trace, as it goes faster and faster, gets lighter and lighter. And one of Tektronix's way to deal with this back then, before they had digital you know, LCD and all this, was to make an, a high intensity CRT, which is what this is. That's what the bright eye was. And you could actually increase the intensity and see the high frequencies just as good as you can see the, the lower frequencies. So right now, and this scope here is very temperamental because of that bright eye screen. It has screen saver and all that. It's very easy to damage this if you turn it up too bright for too long. So the, the intensity controls and everything are kind of finicky. So, uh, you know, we'll have to play with it, when it if it goes to sleep or whatever. But anyhow, the first thing you want to look at is your intensity, which that's what, in, what controls the intensity of your sweep, okay? Now, on some scopes, you'll see on-screen displays like this one. This is a very kind of, this is a very entry-level on-screen display. When you get to the one like that's on my bench, the 2032, the TDS, that's, you know, LCD, digital phosphor, uh, it has all kinds of information on the screen. This will tell you how many volts per division. It'll tell you what um, time scale you're on, okay? So you're vertical and horizontal. And it'll tell you a couple things up here. It can take some, it can take some measurements on its own without you having to count graticules. So that's pretty neat. We'll get into all that there in a little bit. But right now we just want to use the scope um, in what we call free run mode. Okay. So to measure something on a scope, there's a few rules that you have to learn. And this is going to apply to almost any oscilloscope that you work on. And I know there's a lot of videos out there, people talking about scopes and things. But the really the first thing I think I should go over with when operating an oscilloscope is the safety rules. And when I talk about safety, certainly we talk about personal safety for ourselves, but we have to guard that oscilloscope's safety as much as our own safety. It's very easy to damage an oscilloscope, and I'll give you some ideas as to why. Um, the first thing is, let's look at an oscilloscope probe for a minute, okay? I'm going to move the camera down and uh, show you the probe here. This is the probe that's plugged in, and you see it, it we've now gone to BNC connectors, which are much more well suited to high frequency signals than those banana plugs. Okay. Um, so let's go down here and look at this, at this probe. Okay. And you'll see that there's a couple different types of probes. So probes make the scope in some instances. As a matter of fact, you know, a good Tektronix high frequency probe, you know, like these, you're looking at two to three hundred dollars or more for one probe, depending on what frequency bandwidth it's rated for. Probes are very expensive. A lot of people don't realize it, but you can spend as much on a good probe as you do on your whole scope these days. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So, the first thing you want to look at is your probe consists of the tip, which is where you're taking your measurements, and the ground clip, where what, it, what you're going to connect to your reference. You always reference things, right? When we measure with a voltmeter, you put your positive probe on the thing that you're measuring, and you put your negative probe on the reference, or the ground, or the B minus, or whatever you want to call it, okay? And if you notice the first thing here, this, this little ground lead is very, very short, okay? And it is also very, very thin. It's really not designed to carry any kind of current, okay? That's very important to know. Oscilloscopes really are not designed for current measurements of any type. Anything that's going to induce a current somehow onto the scope is going to potentially damage it. 
Remember, everything that we measure has to be a voltage. If we try to measure anything other than voltage, it's not going to work. To the point where we have to convert, if we want to measure current, we have to convert that current into a voltage. Well, how the heck do we do that? Well, you do that by taking a resistor, for instance, like this, okay, and you put that resistor in series with whatever circuit you're working on, and then you measure the voltage drop across that resistor, and you use Ohm's law, right, I equals current equals voltage divided by resistance. So what you would do is you would measure this voltage, divide it, right, by the resistance, and that will give you your current in amps. And that's how you do it. So the reason I, I'm telling you this is everything we measure with the scope is going to really be a voltage, <laughs> but it's going to be can, if it's not voltage, you have to do something to convert it to a voltage if you want to read current or something. The other thing is this little skinny probe, this little skinny ground lead, is connected to the negative portion of the BNC plug. Okay, And if we go back up here to our scope, and we move it back over here where we can see, this outer ring of the BNC connector is connected to the ground prong of the plug. So you have your AC cord here. Okay, here's an AC power cord. This ground prong is internally connected in the scope to this. Okay, to this outer, this outer part of the BNC connector. That's very important. Because what happens if you connect this tip, this ground lead, to something that is not at ground potential with respect to you know, AC, your mains ground? You are going to put that voltage onto this ground here. And potentially, you could cause a short, you know, a really bad short. And a couple things can happen. Number one, you can blow this wire apart. I've seen it happen. It'll burn the wire right in half. It'll just vaporize. Number two, you can cause damage to the scope. Number three, you're holding this probe. So that voltage can now go into you and cause damage to you. So when you're using an oscilloscope, you have to understand the circuit that you're testing before you even consider connecting your scope. Now, for those of you who are just watching this video and really aren't learning anything about scopes, you already know. I, I know you in the comments you'll want to say, well, you can use differential mode and use a differential probe and all these things, but I'm not getting into that yet. Okay, so, so basically, remember this ground tip, okay? That's safety rule number one. The ground has to be isolated. So if you're working on an electronic piece of equipment, make sure it's plugged into an isolation transformer, make sure that it's battery operated, make sure that the chassis ground or your ground reference that you're going to measure is at the same ground point as your ground prong for your AC mains plug. Okay. Now, a lot of equipment today is grounded and always referenced to ground, but there's stuff out there that's not. It has what's called a floating ground, and if you have a floating ground and you connect this up, you're going to be in trouble. Okay. And you don't want to damage your very expensive probe, your very expensive scope, or your priceless you uh, by not being safe. So that's, that's a word of warning right there, and you need to remember that. First, if you don't remember anything else about using a scope, that's the one thing you want to commit to memory, okay? Know your circuit before you hook it up. You're doing this at your own risk, but you're also doing this at your equipment's risk as well. Okay, so we'll turn this back on and let it boot up.
and we'll go over some of the basic functions of the scope and how to connect it to a circuit. Okay, so we're booting this up and as we're doing that we're going to connect the probe and the probe connects in here. Now on a Tektronix scope and some of the other higher end scopes you'll notice that the plug at the end has this little pin. You see it? That pin actually comes in contact with this little ring out here and there's a little resistor inside this connector that goes between this pin and the outer shield, the ground. And this scope will actually measure the resistance between those and that resistance actually tells the oscilloscope what multiplier of probe is on here. So if you look at this probe, this one, let's see if it says it somewhere. Uh, here we go. This probe right here says 10x. That means 10 times. So that means whatever you put on the tip, you're going to get one-tenth of that out of here. Now it's the opposite of what you think. This probe divides the signal by 10, but when you look at the display, so for instance let's set it to one volt per division, one volt for each graticule, remember we learned that on the last video, then if we divide what goes into this tip by 10, one tenth of this is coming out of here, we times this by 10. It's confusing, isn't it? So basically what that means is if I have this at one volt per division right here, and I put 10 volts on here, I will get one volt out here but it's really 10 because <laughs> I measured 10. This, you got to count for the, the loss in the probe. And they do that on purpose. The reason they do that, a couple reasons. Reason number one is you can read a higher voltage on this oscilloscope by a factor of 10 if you're using a 10 times probe. But also that probe by putting that in there is putting a 10 mega ohm resistor in series with this probe. So you're actually putting 10 mega ohms of resistance between the probe and the oscilloscope. So in other words, you're putting a really high impedance on, you know, in front of the oscilloscope and therefore this this will put very very little load or very very little attenuation across whatever circuit you're measuring. Does that make sense? Okay, I told you I could teach an entire class just on oscilloscope probes, and maybe we'll get a little more into them later on. Um, but little by little, you know, we'll learn. So, remember I told you that some of these better scopes will have this little pin with the resistor? Watch what happens to my number here when I plug this in. What'd that just say? Now look, I'll unplug the probe, I'll plug the probe back in. See what that does? So this oscilloscope, remember this is an, a relatively old scope, this oscilloscope knows what kind of probe you're plugging into it. Now this only works um, on Tektronix probes, you know, with the Tektronix scope. So you're, you're you can't just take any old probe and plug in there and have that work unless it is specifically designed uh, for Tektronix type scopes. So if you look at this one, this is a probe from a company called Probe Master and they make very very good pro aftermarket probes for the different scopes. And This one if you notice has that pin on it as well and it will also uh, work and tell it that it's a 10 times probe. Okay, see there? So, uh, but again, those kinds of probes are very expensive. You can get a times 10 probe that does not have that little pin on it. And even though it's a 10 times probe, this number will never change. 
you have to remember in your mind that whatever you're putting in there is going to be times 10. Okay, so you see the, the trick of using an oscilloscope is always knowing what scale you're on as far as your volts per division and your time per division. Very, very important. Okay, so the name of the game is setting the scope for the scale that you want to measure. So if I were measuring, let's say, a 50 volt power supply, um, I would want, for instance, to make this 10 volts per division, let's say, because that way I can have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 volts. And you notice that little span from 0 volts up to 50 fits on my screen. If I had this set too low, let's say 2 volts per, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 volts would be the highest I can see. I get much past that and I'm off the screen. So you always want to pick a voltage. I always like to start higher than I think I'm going to measure. And then if the signal's too scrunched and too tiny, I increase or decrease my volts per division until I can see the waveform very clearly and it fits on the screen. You want, you want it to take up as much of the screen as possible so you can see it in the most detail as possible. Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing. The other thing we were, we're going to talk about is coupling. Do you remember on the last video we did and I showed you, I told you that that was an AC coupled scope only. That means it could only read an AC voltage which that kind of limited us as to what we could do, didn't it? Because if you can only read AC signals, if I hook up something DC, my trace is not going to do anything. So here's my trace, and we're going to set this to 500 millivolts per division. Okay, we're going to slow it down. Okay. And you can see how the scope is just picking up noise, and you can, you, but you can actually, if you ground it, you see that straightens it out. So let's go to five hundred millivolts per division. Okay, so that means each one of these squares is going to be half a volt, right? and let me get something out. Hold on a second. Okay, here we have just a basic run-of-the-mill AA battery. And you know a AA battery should read around one and a half volts per division, right? So if I take this and I go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, what happens? See how it goes up? So it's going up to about here. So if I go half a volt, you know, 500 millivolts, 1,000 millivolts, which is one volt, 1,500 millivolts. That's right there, right? So let's look again. Just a little over 1,500. And you can see the voltmeter is reading 1.62 volts. And yes, this scope even has a built-in voltmeter. See how it measures it? 1.62 volts? Just barely see it. Uh, I'm not sure how well it's showing up on, this, on the screen there, on the camera. But So what we just found out is this oscilloscope can actually read DC volts. And because the reason that we could do that is if you look very carefully under the volts per division knob we have your little this is called your coupling adjustment and you can see it's set to DC right now now if I set it to AC and I do the same test so see how it's on AC what do you think is going to happen if I put this battery on here now so I'm going to take my battery hook up 
the negative and the positive. Did you see what it did? Just for a split second it jumped and then nothing. It's doing just like the other oscilloscope did. Not reading. <laughs> and if you look down here it's actually saying it's giving you a little symbol of AC. See the little AC symbol? If I move it back down to DC that little AC symbol goes away. You see that? So that is how you measure AC and DC. Now you might say to yourself, well why would I ever need to change it? Why don't I leave it on DC all the time? And there's a very good reason for that. Sometimes you may read a signal and you're going to, you guys that work on electronics uh, that are going to get into electronics uh, are going to see this, I promise you. Those of you already in to electronics have definitely are going to know what I'm talking about. But there are times where you are looking at an AC signal that is riding on top of a DC signal. In other words, the signal is not resting at ground. It's above ground and then it is oscillating above ground. So the, the, you basically have the, the AC riding on the DC. Now you might, you see this a lot in radios where you know you might have, you, know, you might be in a stage where you're looking at an oscillator and the oscillator is not oscillating between zero volts and whatever volts. It's actually sitting maybe at four or five volts and then the little AC signal is riding on top of that. And if I move this scale big enough that I can fit the signal, you know, the DC part on there, that little AC will look like a teeny, teeny, tiny little ripple on top of that line. You can't even read it. So in that case, we can go to DC, or to AC, I'm sorry, and when you AC couple it, it will ignore the DC component of that waveform and only read the AC component. So that's why you, that's why having um, switchable um, coupling is so important. Okay. So the next thing we want to know is we set it. We learned how to set our volts per division so that it fits in the scale, and now we learn to set our coupling. Okay. Now ground is a good feature when you turn this on ground that makes the signal, it, it almost makes it like I shorted the probe to the, the tip to the ground. And that allows us to, if we want to set the position of, this, of the trace, see how I'm setting it? So if I want to see an AC signal, I may want this trace to begin at the center of the screen so it can swing positive and negative and positive and negative. So you notice on a lot of my audio uh, videos I do on like stereo amplifiers and things. When we look at the at the speaker, um, a lot of times if I'm looking at one channel, I'll put the the trace in the center, so you can see it s swing up and down, positive and negative. If I'm looking at something that's going to be positive going only, then I might move my trace to the bottom like this, so that I have more room to watch it swing up and down. So that's why there's a position adjustment for your trace. That moves it so that the part you want to see is in the middle of the screen where, where you can see it best. Okay, So we have our volts per division, we have our coupling, and then we have our positioning. So far, we haven't touched anything in the horizontal yet, have we? We're only looking at what the, um, what the vertical uh, or the volts per division input does. Now if you notice our little symbol here changes to the little ground symbol. So we're still set to 5 volts per division but we're grounded so if we put a signal on there right now it won't read anything. And don't worry it's not really grounding the probe it's just showing you the tr putting the trace on where ground would be on the screen. So if you look I touch this once again nothing. But if I go back to DC, we can look at our signal again. And there it goes. Whoop. 
and it's at 5 volts per division so you notice it just barely goes up and that's why you want your volts per division to be somewhere now if I really wanted to see detail I could go all the way down here and I could go to 200 millivolts per division let's see if we got enough to fit nope it's still off scale so 500 millivolts is where we go and again 1.62 volts okay so now there's one more that I saved for last and it's this one right here and I'm going to zoom in on this I really want you to look carefully at, at what I'm talking about here if you notice here there's a one called 50 ohms all right now this is a really good thing um, and not every scope has this really only the higher end ones do but you'll see this from time to time um, and the, the brand new versions these ones we're going to look at last they almost all of them have that but again what this means is when I switch down to here and you notice it turns a different color as well it's not green they really want you to know what you're doing use this with extreme caution that's actually putting a 50 ohm termination it's like putting a 50 ohm resistor across th this probe and why would you ever want to do that well remember I told you this is a high impedance device it's looking at you know mega ohms and mega ohms between the scope you know the scope doesn't really pose any load to anything it's a very small load but when we switch it to 50 ohms all of a sudden it looks like a 50 ohm load and can you guys guess anything that would be 50 ohms well a lot of things in radio are 50 ohms um, television is 75 ohms too but when we're talking about like antennas for like ham radio or for CB radio um, things like that they're all referenced to 50 ohm loads so what this is going to do is it's going to simulate that 50 ohm load. The problem is it's very, very limited to the voltage you can actually apply across this terminal. If you look up here, I disconnected the probe. When you're in one mega ohm mode, okay, which is, there's a one mega ohm load across here normally when you're in DC or AC coupling. So that means from the center to this outer shell it poses a 1 million ohm load or 1 mega ohm load to the circuit that you're putting under test and then when you add that probe <clears throat> this times 10 probe you're adding an additional 10 mega ohms or 10 million ohms so you're actually putting 11 million ohms between this scope and the device under test so it influences the circuit very very little you know doesn't load it down and as long as we're even just hooking directly into here at that one mega ohms this thing can actually handle up to 400 volts peak power so peak meaning if it's an AC signal it can't peak out above 400 volts that's a pretty good amount of, of voltage so these things can handle some pretty high voltage um, when they're in normal mode but when we switch down to this DC mode and go or into this 50 ohm mode all of a sudden look what it says 5 volts if you put more than 5 volts into this scope with it in 50 ohm coupling mode you will damage your scope so this is something to be used with extreme caution this really isn't meant to be looking at large signals this is to be looking at signals very accurately with a 50 ohm load. So if we want to measure a voltage um, you know, of an oscillator in an oscillator circuit, those are always in millivolts or even le less. They're very small voltages. So you're, you're well under that 5 volts. But if you tried to measure <laughs> a stereo speaker like I do, um, you know, the, an amplifier can put out you know, 20, 30, 50 volts way above this you will you'll fry your scope keep that in mind 
really most of you will never ever you I have never used this almost never if I'm gonna do something like this I'll put a termination load on it externally um, or I'll use my uh, spectrum analyzer because I'm looking at a frequency or something like that but just understand that's in there if you guys just accidentally turn this on and, and don't know what this is and switch it into this and then put a big voltage on it you'll cook your scope and I know a lot of you who are new to the you know to this uh, hobby may want to go online and, and find a nice used scope like this Tektronics I mean some of these can be had for you know hundred dollars couple hundred dollars um, you know a good restored one calibrated and everything this this cost more than that but you know you can get several hundred dollars into them or more but nevertheless it, it is affordable for people who you know really seriously want to get into electronics but that's an investment and you don't want to damage your new scope by forgetting about that okay I know I'm rambling on about some of these things but I think some of you really need to hear it over and over again to get it to, so it sinks in um, the rest of you I appreciate that you're hanging in there and being patient okay so the next thing these knobs along here these the setup buttons I'm not going to really get into those in this particular video because we're going to look at basic functions of a scope and not every one of them has this okay this is only something that more advanced scopes if you go to like the Tektronix 465 is a very old popular scope it's a hundred megahertz bandwidth um, very has all the good controls you need on it and rock solid last forever kind of scope and they made millions of them there was a highly popular oscilloscope um, so the the Tektronix 465 really good scope to buy um, and I'm gonna try to stick with things that would be on that generation and that that kind of level of oscilloscope okay up here in the top we already looked at the position and then this is just how you select the channel this is a four channel scope so what do channels mean <laughs> well as I showed you on the last video it only had that that's that old Bell and Howell scope only had one trace on it okay but if you look at this oscilloscope it can have up to four traces on there and if I hit this button again okay and I move my traces you can see now I have two traces and I can go even further on this one I can add another one there's three traces and yet another one for four traces so I can actually monitor four separate signals at one time okay now that being said the way this oscilloscope does it it kinda cheats a little bit and what it does is each time it's sweeping and when we talk about the sweeping remember here's this here's the trace sweeping see it going across there okay I'm gonna turn that down so it doesn't damage anything so, but you can see it see the little trace going that's one channel now watch what happens if I go to two channels you can see down here I get my second volts per division but look one goes then the other they alternate so really it's cutting my time base in half in a way because it can only it it only sweeps every other it uses every other sweep for for each channel okay now they make real-time dual trace scopes where both traces will go at the same time okay so for instance the Tektronix TDS 3032 the the really fancy one you see on my desk or on my bench that one both traces can sweep at the same time but on these older ones that's how they do it okay so this is another difference if you buy an older scope versus some of the newer ones now Tektronix did make what was called a dual beam scope very very old way before these like in the 19 like 60s and 70s they had them but they were laboratory grade equipment they were huge and heavy and very expensive very very they had to have very special CRTs that could that had two electron guns to make two physical beams at the same time is very special design 
and really that's not something you're going to see a whole lot of. The scope that you're going to buy is going to be like this, um, if you buy an older scope like this, okay? So I just thought you'd be interested in seeing that. So there you go. So really that covers the, the vertical input of the scope, and we're not going to look at dual traces for, in this video. We're just going to pretend this is a single trace scope, okay? Because most of what you're going to look at, you're only going to look at one waveform at a time. Sometimes you can look at two, like when I do the stereos, you notice I can put both speakers on and I use the position knobs to adjust the two traces apart so we can actually look at them uh, at right and left channel at the same time. You know, there's an example why you'd use two channels, but typically you use one channel. All right. Okay. So we learned about the readout and, you know, and all that. We learned about positioning vertically, and we learned about our volts per division and our times one and times 10 probes. We learned about coupling AC and DC, and we learned about the, some of the dangers we have to think of with this 50 ohms. And we also learned about that this outer band here, or this, uh, the negative terminal of this BNC jack is connected to AC mains ground. So anything that this hooks up to is going to also be hooked up to your earth ground, okay? Always remember that, super important. And now some people may do what's called floating your scope. They'll cut, physically cut <laughs> the ground prong off of their scope, okay? Any of you old timers out there know what I'm talking about. Cut the prong off. And what that can do is that will raise this to like a floating level. The, the big problem is your case, your metal case of this scope, everything will be connected to this. So if you connect that to a live signal, this whole scope becomes electrically live. Now, number one, what do you think that might do to your scope? You know, if you have an arc or something like that. But more importantly, what if you touch something that's grounded and then you touch your scope? What do you think is going to happen to you? So my recommendation is never float your scope. Never put your scope onto an isolation transformer, you know, for the same reason. Put the device that you're testing on an isolation transformer and put this thing directly on your mains where it belongs. And then you have that electrical isolation. Any of you who don't understand what an isolation transformer is, I know m multiple ones of my videos, especially like my radio, old uh, tube radio restore videos, a couple of times I really go into that a little bit. So you may want to watch through that. There's also lots of other people who did fantastic videos on that. I recommend you look into learning about is electrical isolation. It could save you your life. It could save your health. <laughs> it could really save your test equipment. So again, you know, I, mention, I keep bringing safety up, but it's so important because now we're talking about the safety of you. We've always talked about the safety of you, don't we? But now we have to start talking about the safety of our test equipment because it's very delicate. I think you, you can really damage one of these very easily if you don't know what you're doing. And you don't want to ruin, buy a nice new scope and hook it up wrong and damage it your first day. That would be horrible. So I want to see you use this successfully and safely. All right, so does that give you guys an idea of how the volts per division works? We hooked up that battery and we were able to read the voltage now. And it was very accurate, wasn't it? It was a lot more accurate than that other scope, wasn't it? Okay, now when we come back, we're gonna start on the, the horizontal, right? Which is our sweep, okay? So let me get some things set up and we'll come back and we'll look at that. So one of the reasons I chose this scope, um, other than it's <laughs> one of the ones that's available to me, is um, the way that it's laid out. Uh, if you notice, you know, so far we've been able to kind of break this down into little sections and that's how the, the control dials on this scope are laid out which I really like. 
you'll find that a lot of scopes are like that and there's a few of them that aren't but up until this point we've learned you know the volts per division the vertical part component of this of your scope now we're going to work on the horizontal and if if you recall from the first video we did um, and the second video that we did one of the limitations of the older style scopes was that even though we could speed up or slow down you know how how fast the sweep goes across we really don't have an accurate way of controlling that or measuring it now when we talk about modern oscilloscopes they actually have a calibrated time base for the sweep what that means is that it actually can set a specific speed at which that trace will sweep across the screen so if you look down here right now it's saying 20 milliseconds okay so let's turn that down a little bit 20 milliseconds and what that means is that each if we could slow this way down now we're to 100 milliseconds if you look at that little trace dot basically from it for it to go from this end of the graticule to this end of the graticule in other words for it to move one division it takes 100 milliseconds so if we count all the divisions one two three four five six seven eight nine ten it should take ten of those hundred milliseconds to get from this side of the screen to this side of the screen exactly so what we're saying is if this is a hundred milliseconds per division and we have ten divisions it should take a total of one second which is ten times a hundred milliseconds hundred milliseconds is point one of a second so point one times ten is one so it would be one second to go from here to here I know I'm repeating myself um, those of you who are familiar with oscilloscopes this is all review uh, may not be the video for you other than just the entertainment of watching me uh, ramble on about this but for those of you who are really trying to learn what an oscilloscope is um, because it's just been something you've been interested in but kinda haven't known where to go that's what this is really all about so what what the idea of this is again an oscilloscope a modern DC oscilloscope like this that has DC coupling uh, not like our old scope it can technically measure or look at a DC voltage but that's really not what these scopes were designed for an oscilloscope I mean you have a multimeter or a voltmeter that can do that just fine this is really looking at voltage that changes over time and especially it is good at looking at voltages that change in a repeating or predictable manner over time we call that a waveform and when we're setting our horizontal adjustment the idea is you want all the changes of that voltage over that period of time to be able to fit in one screen width so we can look at quote unquote the whole picture okay so let me hook something up and I'll give you an example of that I have a signal connected up here and uh, as you can see it looks just like kinda like an arch and gee I wonder uh, you know that uh, might be just what we're looking at okay we don't know you know what that is I've never seen a waveform like that but uh, let's see what happens if we adjust our horizontal and now you can see there's another half to it that we were missing and I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that if I keep going in a little more now we can see several iterations of that waveform and that's telling us that we uh, you know we have a repetitive waveform now and the horizontal sweep 
is what enables us to either scrunch it together or stretch it out to see it better. Now, let's see what else we can do here. <laughs> okay, and there we go. And you can see that's a modulated AM signal. And if we look even closer, okay, let's change it a little bit more. Okay, now what we're looking at is what looks like some sort of a really strange looking sine wave, huh? Or something. It's kind of like an undulating pattern. And this is now another example of how our horizontal sweep can tell us different things. Now, if you look right now, we're at 500 microseconds per division, okay? And remember, frequency is one divided by time. Okay, so you could actually take that and you can take one, take the reciprocal of that, and that will tell you how many cycles per second or how many hertz that signal is. Okay, um, now here's the thing is there more information that we're missing? You know, we see a lot of haziness in there. Now, a lot of you who are already into uh, electronics already know what you're looking at. But uh, for those of you who don't, watch what adjusting this horizontal sweep speed can do. And look at that. Now we're down to five microseconds. So we are looking at a hundred, we're sweeping a hundred times faster than we were before. And if you look, there's actually a sine wave in there. But once again, that is not a steady sine wave. Now, it looks like it might be, but it really isn't. Because what's happening is we're only looking at a very small portion of the entire waveform. Okay, so we're zooming in on it really, really close. If I open this back up, you start to see how this starts to, let's zoom in a little closer. You start to see how this waveform changes until you get back to this. Now, those waveforms, that sine wave that we were looking at, now we're at one millisecond per division. Okay, so we are, this is, each one of these squares is one one thousandth of a second. Okay, and if we look, we can, we can move this around with our horizontal position knob. Okay, let's back up. Here's our horizontal control. Here's the horizontal positioning. And if I line this up on a, gradic, on a line, and then I measure to my next, to, to this, to the next line, or the next time it goes here, I'm at one, two, and about two and a half, okay? So that would be 2.5 milliseconds from one part of the sweep to the, to the first time it repeats. So if we take one over that 2.5, Okay, what you're going to find out is it's going to work out to, hold on, let me do it. Okay, so let's say it is, let me see if I can do this for you here. So one millisecond, first of all, is 0 0.001 seconds. You got to keep all your, uh, all your units here, your decimals in the correct place. So if it's one 2.5, all right, let me zoom you in a little better so you can read this a little better. Come on, focus. Here we go. If I take 
1 divided by 0 0.0025 that equals 400 okay so from here to here okay if we measure that this part of the waveform that's undulating right here is 400 Hertz or 400 cycles per second now let's sweep back in again or back out till we get to this let's read this one and let's see if we can if we can move this nope not quite so we got to go in a little more so if we move this so it crosses the line here and then we have one two wait a minute <laughs> one two three four five so exactly five times two microseconds is ten microseconds okay and if we do the math on that and we take one divided by ten microseconds we find out that it ends up being 100,000 or 100 kilohertz so what does this all mean what are you looking at well what we just looked at is what you would see in a radio okay this is an amplitude modulated sine wave so what you're looking at is a hundred megahertz sine wave that is modulated at 400 Hertz and we were able to measure all of this just by adjusting that horizontal control so now you see how changing that sweep can show you different different aspects of a waveform there was no one particular setting where we could get the entire picture was there right here there's no way I could have measured that there's a hundred kilohertz in there okay as a matter of fact if I change it to 200 kilohertz guess what that's 200 kilohertz doesn't look any different than the 100 kilohertz does it I just doubled the frequency and really it didn't change anything this is still 400 Hertz because you're looking right now the only component you're looking at is the modulation okay in other words that 400 Hertz is riding on top of that two, 200 kilohertz sine wave okay so the 200 si kilohertz sine wave would be what we would call our carrier and this would be called our modulation that we're looking at so if we go back out and we remeasure this so we're crossing right here and then we go one two two and a half two point five at two right and we do so two point five times two is five microseconds right so one two and a half so five microseconds and we take one divided by five microseconds is 200,000 and that shows that it's 200 kilohertz so but again we have to go to two different settings of our horizontal to see the entire picture of that waveform this is what we call a complex waveform there's more to it than just one thing okay so I hope you kind of from this gathered the purpose of your horizontal sweep okay we can't fit that entire picture in this particular setting okay so you can't but you can't look at everything if you do fit the entire picture <laughs> in this one screen so does that make sense I hope I didn't confuse you more so what this is showing us is that the amplitude 
is going up and down. That's the voltage is changing. The voltage is getting higher and lower and higher and lower. See that? The voltage is going higher, lower, higher, lower. So we're looking at the amplitude, but we're also looking at the frequency at which that amplitude is changing. So there's the, the amplitude and frequency are changing at two different rates on this, okay? They're changing at every 400 hertz. It's making one complete cycle. And at 200 kilohertz, it's making one complete cycle. Okay? And by moving this knob back and forth, we're able to see that. Okay? I know I'm going really, really slow, but I hope, I hope I'm making sense what the oscilloscope's doing. And really, those are the two main functions of an oscilloscope, right? We have the vertical, which is a, allows us to be able to see the up and down of the voltage. And we have the horizontal, which is allowing us to see that change over a period of time. And that's really what scopes are good for. This is what they're, they're really their main purpose is, is to look at a changing voltage over a period of time. And this horizontal adjustment adjusts how much time we go, we're going to look at in this one screen. And this volts per division looks at how much change or how much voltage or how much amplitude you're going to see. Okay, from maximum to minimum. Does that make sense? Very good. Okay, so that is pretty much the function of an oscilloscope. So we learned the adjustments here, we learned what the vertical does, and we learned what the horizontal does. We learned a little bit about an oscilloscope probe. Okay, now the next thing we're going to look at is what we're going to, and we learned about coupling, remember AC and DC coupling, and now we're going to look at what the trigger is. Okay, so this is the next part that we're going to be interested in seeing. Now, this is something that's only on more modern oscilloscopes. If you notice, that old scope that we worked on in the first two videos, really all they had was like a sink adjustment. And it was a very, very, it was the precursor to your trigger. Okay, so let's turn off the modulation for a second. And let's just look at our 200 kilohertz signal. And if we look at our 200 kilohertz now, um, what you're going to notice is that it's really stable. You remember on that other scope, it was just kind of bouncing around and everything? Well, that's because it did not have a trigger circuit in it. And what a trigger circuit does is if you notice up here, we have a little knob. Okay, we're not going to talk about all these buttons first. We're going to just talk about this one knob. And that is our trigger level. Okay, and what that level is doing is it's saying with respect to zero, with respect to ground, okay, at what point do I want the scope to start sweeping when it sees when it's when it sees a change in the voltage from zero okay so there's two different two different things that can happen if we look if we look at zero let's look at ground for a second notice ground I'm, I'm set it ground my coupling so our ground is right here when I go back to DC coupling what's happening is I have the scope set right now, the trigger, and you can see as I move this trigger, okay, it's straight up and down right now. So what that means is as soon as you start to see a change going up or down, trigger. In other words, start, start a sweep going from here to here, okay? If I turn it towards the negative, you can notice it's looking, it's triggering on a negative. And when I turn it the other way, it's triggering on a positive signal. 
okay? And we call that your slope, your rising and falling slope, okay? Now, right next to this knob, we have a slope adjustment. See the word slope? And if I push that button, see how it goes from a minus to a plus? It's set at plus right now. If I change that slope, let me back off so you can see what I'm doing, from plus to minus, okay, let me get you zoomed in a little better. See what happens? Now what does that mean? The slope means not only am I, do I have to have that level, I have to have... Okay, let me back up. <laughs> I'm confusing everybody and my, confusing myself. The level is how much change has to happen from zero volts before you start to trigger a sweep of that dot going from here to here. The plus and minus tells you which direction that that amplitude has to change. So if I'm at plus, anytime it sees a rise in voltage, it's going to trigger. If there's a fall in voltage, in other words, the voltage is going negative, it's not going to trigger. If I change this to negative, that means trigger when you see a negative going slope. Okay? So right there, as soon as you see a negative going slope, the dot starts to move. Okay? And that's, that's very important because we're, whenever, whenever the signal goes from here to here or from here to here, it's crossing this zero point here, and that's called your zero crossing. Okay, and your oscilloscope with that trigger circuit, it's using that to figure out where that waveform is and when to start triggering so that it can trigger in a repetitive manner. Basically, it's, it's moving that dot across there. It's starting that motion each time the voltage moves in a certain set way. And that's what keeps this locked in. If you didn't have a trigger, this would not lock in like this. It would be bouncing all over the place just like it was on that old scope. But with the trigger circuit, we can tell it. As soon as this starts to go negative, and when it's in the middle, it means just barely go negative, trigger, start, start sweeping. And when I move this knob right or left, you can see it loses, it starts to lose its synchronization. Okay? So there you go. Um, now, the reason we have plus and minus is because sometimes you're looking at something that is only going to um, go in one pulse. And it may only pulse up or down. If it's pulsing positive and you have it set to looking for a negative going wave or negative going trigger, it's not going to it's not going to trigger until the waveform is done and comes down and conversely if you have a negative going signal that goes positive and it's just one pulse it won't trigger now the next knob on your trigger is going to be your your level or your auto and normal and single sweep so if we change that to normal Okay, see how it's set to normal? It was set to auto. That means it just kept repeatedly triggering over and over and over again. Now I have it set to normal. Watch what's going to happen. Soon as I unplug this, it no longer triggers. Okay, the, the sweep goes away. It's waiting for a signal. If I set it to auto, my sweep comes back because it just sits there. That's called roll mode. It rolls. The signal just keeps sweeping back and forth again and again. If I go to normal, it's armed right now. It's sitting there waiting for a signal, and it's not going to sweep until it sees a signal. As soon as I plug in my signal, it starts to sweep. As soon as I, the signal goes away, it stops sweeping. 
Now this doesn't mean a whole lot right now on this oscilloscope, okay? Um, you're not going to see the benefit of this until you start getting into what's called a storage oscilloscope, okay? Which means it can save a signal that it saw in the past and keep it displayed on the screen even when that signal goes away. That's called storage. This scope really doesn't have storage, but it does have all the other features, okay? It does have an adjustable trigger. So you see what that does? So what you're doing is when you're trying to synchronize something, so you hook up, you know, you hook up a signal and you can see it's gone right now. And that's because I don't have this synchronized properly. I'm going to move my knob until my signal pops on. Now when I'm in auto mode <laughs> and I get it out of sync, it just garbles all over the screen. And you can see I don't have a waveform. I just have, oh, this is, it, it's shuddering all over the screen. It doesn't know when to start and it's randomly starting and triggering. But once we get that sync set and we have our positive or negative slope set properly, it locks in. So really what I want you to get away from, take away from this whole thing is your trigger is actually what allows you to get a stable signal on the screen so you can kind of synchronize to it. Now there's all kinds of different ways to synchronize, okay? Um, this is just the basic, you know, adjusting the knob and the, the slope, but we can actually sync off of something else. So if you look down, uh, let's see, I don't think it's, it's on the rear of the scope on this one, I think. But you can synchronize, for instance, we can have what's called an external sync, and some scopes have that on the front, this one doesn't. Or you can use one of your other channels as the sync channel. In other words, some, so some signals have their own synchronized waveform that they're locked on to. And you can lock your scope onto that same synchronized waveform so your scope and that device are both tracking off of that same sync signal. Okay? And so what we would do in that instance is we would have the waveform coming into channel 1 and then we could turn on channel 2. See how we did that? And then we can tell it to trigger source. You see where it says source? And if you look right here, right now it's triggering off of itself, right? But I can change this to trigger off of channel 2. Now look what's happening. <laughs> this all got all confused, didn't it? Because it's waiting for that sync signal to come in here. Okay? But if I put that signal into here, a synchronization signal, it would lock in on this and then I would have to get my signal generator to lock onto that same sync signal and everything would track. For instance, you can actually have your, your signal generator, some of the more expensive ones, they can have an external sync and you can generate that from, for instance, my that rubidium frequency standard. You could use that, for instance, as your reference. And you could trigger off of that, and you could trigger your signal generator off of that. And this, this channel right here becomes your tr trigger with that 10 megahertz signal. And this would be your actual signal. Everything would track together. Okay? So, really, those are the three things you want to know about. Um, to at least get started for using an oscilloscope, okay? If you're just using a scope for a single channel, for a single waveform, you just really need to know the coupling. You need to know the volts per division, you know, for your amplitude. You need to know your seconds or your time per division for your horizontal sweep so you can fit the whole thing into, the, into one screen width. And then you need to adjust your trigger to lock on 
to that signal so it's nice and stable and you can set the trigger to to be on auto where it'll just sit there and run all the time and just lock on to anything or nothing or you could set it to normal where it will sit there and wait for that signal to be present before it triggers okay we could set it to trigger when it's going from negative to positive which is a which is a rising slope okay that's your slope setting or you can have it when it's going from a positive to a more negative signal which is a negative slope okay so we set our slope we set our trigger to auto or normal and then we use our sync adjustment or our level adjustment to lock it in okay now some of the more expensive oscilloscopes and you will not see this on some of the little lower end some of the little 20 megahertz cheaper cheaper scopes um, you can actually have different couplings on your trigger as well so they all have DC coupling and AC coupling just like your your uh, volts per division has DC and AC coupling okay but more than that we can actually reject certain things so if you see noise reject high frequency reject and low frequency reject okay I have it set to high frequency reject right now and if we go back over to our scope we have no waveform okay now watch what happens when I change it to low frequency reject. now it comes back that's a high frequency signal if it's a if if you're getting false triggering because you have a complex waveform for instance you can use the high frequency low frequency and noise reject to reject that component of the waveform that is false triggering and not letting you lock in on what you want okay and again that's only on the little bit little bit better quality scopes some of the cheaper ones do not have um, noise reject or high frequency low frequency reject on the trigger so that's something that you get you know on a little bit higher end scope now that's really all I want to cover in this particular lesson and I think that's more than enough <laughs> I'm sure I'll get all kind of comments that I worded something wrong or that I explained something wrong or um, I don't know but hey it's what you get okay <laughs> I'm not a college but bottom line one of the other things you're probably going to hear a lot about or have a lot of questions on is should I go ahead and buy one of these older oscilloscopes because this oscilloscope here is probably I'd say it's probably 30 years old um, you know they've been around a while May, maybe not 30 years but close to it and um, you know the next generation of scopes that I'm going to show you are down here and these are the ones where you know you're going to look at a higher end modern scope and a lower end modern scope and you're going to see what they can do uh, there you know at the end of the day they have the same functionality as this scope um, so why wouldn't you just buy one of those especially since you can buy these low-cost scopes here for a couple hundred bucks brand new you know maybe three hundred dollars you can buy a brand new one of these whereas you could easily tie up two or three hundred in one of these in really good calibrated condition or even more um, so why would you even want that well it really depends on a lot of factors there's no real good answer as to you know first of all Tektronics is extremely high quality Roden Schwartz is high quality HP is high quality um, you know there's quite a few out there that are very high quality uh, you know industrial grade oscilloscopes um, but really it depends on what you're going to do as to what you know as to what it is you're going to uh, you know what what you're going to want in an oscilloscope you're probably most of you who are just going to tinker around on a bench you're probably after you see these the newer scopes you're probably going to want one of those but some of you who are nostalgic and likes to work on radio for instance 
I just love the look of the trace on, you know, on a CRT type oscilloscope myself. I really do. Um, and I use these an awful lot still. I really do. Um, when I'm working on a video, you see me use the other ones more because they're more colorful, they're easier to see, screens are bigger, lots of reasons why I would use that. And they have built-in measurements and all kinds of things. We'll get into that later. But these are really solid scopes. And you can get lower end model, like the model 465 or 485. They're even more basic than this and they're super reliable. Um, and they're easy to use. They're very intuitive. They, they're laid out like this where you have, you know, volts per division, seconds per division, trigger. Everything is separated, easy to work with, easy to understand, easy to set up, and easy to lock on to a signal like this and get it to show up. So, uh, yeah, there, there's still a really good argument for purchasing these older scopes. And I think um, Dave over on EEV blog just did a quick update video on buying a, a $50 used oscilloscope online and you can buy them for 50 bucks you can maybe not this particular model but like the 465s sometimes you can find those or the Hitachis um, they're all very those are all very good scopes some of the some of the HPs are extremely good scopes and I've seen a lot of those on sale for 50 bucks and um, you know they just kind of work and I, I like them. So I'll leave the decision up to you what kind you like. But for right now, um, like I said, I'm kind of doing this video series off the cuff. We're real busy at work and everything. So uh, sorry if, I, if I'm not doing this as clearly as I could. But hey, <laughs> um, you notice right now this is counting down. The reason it's counting down is these bright eye scopes with the really high high intensity CRTs, they actually have a screen saver built into them. And if you don't move a knob within that amount of seconds, it'll actually turn the screen off and blank out. And it does that to protect the CRT um, because these CRTs can actually get screen burn. That's another thing you have to think about if you're going to get uh, one of these older oscilloscopes with a CRT. The CRTs can get screen burn, meaning the phosphors can actually get a shade to them and burn in like these, these numbers or the, if you leave the trace in one place for a long time or if you put it in XY mode, which we haven't talked about yet, it'll burn a dot right into the screen very quickly if you're not careful. Um, on the newer LCD, newer scopes, they don't have that problem. So just another thing to keep keep aware of okay so basic use of a basic oscilloscope there it is and uh, in the next video we're going to talk about some of the more advanced features and we're going to move over to the newer scope when we do that and we're also going to talk about a little more about scope safety we talked about that a little bit in this video we're going to get a little more into that and a little more into in depth on probes because there's so many different types of oscilloscope probes how to adjust the probe um, yes they are they do have to be calibrated to the scope um, some of the differences in the different probes and uh, how to use them so and then finally we'll get into the more uh, modern scopes and start talking about sample rates and things that these old scopes really you didn't have to worry about <laughs> that's another thing that separates a you know a cheaper scope from a more expensive scope when you're getting into these modern ones and we'll talk more about that later but uh, I think this is enough of a video for for this video you know enough length of time and uh, when we pick up on the next video we'll start looking at the things I just mentioned and I hope you're enjoying this. If nothing else, I hope it's at least entertaining you. Uh, and uh, I know I'm having fun shooting them. So anyways, once again, I appreciate all you who have subscribed. I appreciate all you who give me the wonderful comments. You know, I, I've, I've had so many. I, this is going to be a really long Q&A this month. Um, I just, I can't believe how many questions and, and comments I've had.
and uh, I appreciate all the kind words from all of you. So once again, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you all for coming along. I wish you all the best health and uh, happiness and joy in your lives. And once again, don't keep the faith, share it with others, and we'll see you next time.